Okay, well, happy Monday, happy November 1st. Hope everyone survived Halloween. Um, does someone want to lead the Pledge of Allegiance for us? Sure. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> Well, please join me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much. This week and every week. <laughs> uh, Michael, between, between you and Michael, so you've got the Pledge of Allegiance covered here. Uh, I know. Any guests? We have any guests with us today? Anyone want to introduce themselves? But I think everyone looks familiar here. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, chamber announcements from Renee. Yes. Um, so it's a Halloween themed recap. <laughs> or pretty much all of my announcements. What a weekend. Oh my gosh. So Friday, trunk or treat. I think the best crowd ever. I know several merchants who ran out of candy, uh, some by four o'clock, some even sooner than that, and some barely made it to like quarter to five. So great job at all the merchants and organizations that came out. And uh, oh, my dog is talking to himself. So sorry about that. Um, anyway, uh, great job by everybody. And the community really came out and enjoyed it. So good job. Fantastic turnout for Fortuna. Uh, Saturday was the U.S. Capitol Christmas tree event. I'm going to share my screen and just show you um, a little collage of some of the things. Um, so this is the tree when it came in on the truck. This part was exposed so people could see it. Um, we had our Fortuna PD K9 crew there. Uh, this is Kane uh, Blitz was also there. He's the newest member of the K9 crew. Uh, Kiwanis Club was there handing out hot apple cider and free apples. Um, they had an interpretive display that the HSU students um, helped put together. And so they had different um, tables that you could walk through and check out information on our forests, public lands, um, you know, recycling and reusing. Uh, some forestry service members. This is a giant quilt that was made um, for it. I, I, I didn't get the information on who put all this together, but it was a bunch of organizations. Thing was huge. I think they said it was a 26 foot quilt. Absolutely amazing. Um, this banner was where people could sign it. And then of course we had Woodsy Owl there. So it was super fun, great time. I have a huge list of thank you. So bear with me. Um, it looks like we had about 550 people show up. That was the best guess estimate by our forestry service folks. A huge thank you to Fortuna PD. Um, they pulled out all the stops, bringing that tree into town, helping them get in and out of Fortuna, uh, escorting them off the highway. So great job guys for helping out with that. Uh, the Parks and Rec crew and other city staff that helped put out the signs and get the traffic going in the right direction. Thank you for that. Our California Conservation Corps members who volunteered. We had about 15 volunteers. They were amazing and super helpful. Um, thank you for volunteering your time for that. We could not have done that without you. Jennifer at the River Lodge for getting that open. Um, also Cornerstone Realty for collecting food for Santa Slay. As I said, the Kiwanis Club was passing out apples and hot cider. Alan Baird in the Fortuna Post Office contributed to um, our take-home ornament kits that we got to pass out. Uh, wet construction for use of their yard to keep the tree safe overnight. Um, and then also to the Forest Service and the, their partner, Choose Outdoors, for having you know, even the opportunity to bring it to Fortuna. It's a lot of moving pieces. So thank you to them. Um, also, thank you, Council Member Johnson and Mayor Pro Tem Trent and Michelle Bush now come for coming out and being there. It was great seeing you guys um, and to the community. Um, you know, thank you so much for enjoying it, being supportive and excited about it because it really is a unique experience and probably one most of us won't see again. So it was nice to see the community come out and we had great weather all weekend for these events um, and then of course Sunday was the Spookathon at Roner Park and talk about a turnout oh my gosh I wish somebody was counting the kids that were going into Roner Park because it was 
bananas. That's all I'm going to say. Great job to Emily Apodaca, the Roner Park Rec supervisor. She killed it out of the park and she's already got ideas for next year. So I'm excited for that. Uh, let's see, uh, speaking of the River Lodge, they're hosting their holiday craft fair that's coming up on November 20th and 21st. The doors will open at 10 a.m. and Fortuna High Culinary Arts class will be there serving up lunch. And then our next kind of big event for Fortuna will be the Holiday Dazzle Contest. So Sue Long and I will be putting our heads together with our committee um, and putting out some dates and letting you guys know that's gonna come out down the pike in a couple of weeks. Uh, next week, our special guest will be Lynette Mullins. Um, she is the Humboldt uh, spokesperson for Nordic Aqua Farms, and she's going to tell us all about their land-based fish project um, that they're looking to put in at the Samoa Peninsula. And then finally, don't forget, Sunday night when you go to bed, fall back because it's daylight savings. Uh, so that'll be at 2 a.m., I believe, on a, a Pacific time Sunday morning. So don't forget when you go to sleep or surprise yourself when you wake up and realize you have an extra hour, uh, but also means less daylight. So anyway, that's all I had. I'll turn it back to Bailey. Thanks. Um, I have on here that maybe Becky Jacqueline has uh, something she'd like to share with us. Yeah, a couple of events um, this week, um, both virtual. Um, first off is Humboldt Sponsors. Um, we've had to cancel all of our events this year, and so we're still trying to raise funds because uh, the kids' uh, needs don't quit in a pandemic, and we are still trying to support them. So we're doing an online holiday auction, and it's on, it's on the newsletter that Renee sent out, but it's also, you can find it on, I'm looking it up right now, um, it's called uh, 32auctions.com. Humboldt sponsors. So it's fun holiday things from Thanksgiving, pumpkins to Christmas, fun things that our active members have put together. And it's just kind of a, just one more fun thing to do just to raise some funds. And then also this week on Saturday, another, uh, another virtual is our 40th benefit ball for Red Memorial. So we are raising funds for a new ICU. So the theme is the Raiders of the Lost ICU. So we, it's virtual, anybody's invited, it's free to zoom in on on Saturday night. And the information's also in the um, newsletter that uh, news brief that Renee sent out. So um, we're trying to build a new ICU, which is much needed at Redwood. The old one is pretty sad. And so um, it's been many years since they've had one. So uh, anyway, two events that supporting our community once again. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Merritt, are you still here? Would you like to share some uh, things coming up for the city council meeting tonight? Yeah, before I go to the council meeting, though, I do want to um, thank Renee for pointing out the, the event that we had at the park. I talked to our parks director, Cameron Mole, and I think he said they had 400 bags to hand out, and I think maybe there was a couple thousand kids there total, so... Um, anyway, it was a good event, and he did say they took a lot of notes and things that they could do better, things like music and different, you know, he had, he had a lot of different ideas of how they could improve the event, and, and I think based on the participation, they've seen enough for other city events that they didn't expect the turnout that they did, but it was a really nice day, and so I think we may have found another event that we could squeeze in amongst all the other Fortuna events, so I'm excited for um, Cameron and Emily to, to be on to something there that people are interested in, so I think that's great. Thanks for pointing that out, Renee. And also for all your work on the, the federal Christmas tree. It looks like that was a good turnout too. So thank you. So, uh, and then just a little bit of background. Um, uh, Emily, I know you may talk about the city council special workshop and council member Losey asked, um, asked you to bring it up, but just for everybody else who wasn't at the special workshop on Friday, the council asked me to bring and look at special uh, to look at what what you know what's happening with FBID. What could the future of FBID be? And so there was a there's a lot of information. If you're interested, you can go back and look at the staff report. But really, what the council asked me to do is is move forward working with FBID, see if we can tighten things up from a from a fiscal and administrative perspective. And the council really expressed their desire to become more involved and to see FBID go forward in a positive direction. So I'll be working with Emily and the FBID board to do a number of things from the administrative side and wrapping up the audits and 
updating the contract and bylaws and possibly changes to municipal code. So stay tuned on that. We have a lot of work to do. So it's going to be over the next few months, we'll be doing that and bringing that back to the council. So back to the city council agenda for tonight, there's a number of things. There's going to be a presentation on the Great American Smokeout, the introduction, introduction of our new canine unit. So we did get a second canine that we funded through grant programs, through, through grants. Uh, consent calendar has a number of routine items, but also includes um, a concrete contract with REO Construction, uh, $25,000 um, supplemental budget request to provide matching funds for a headwaters grant, which a city received for doing some planning work for the Fortuna Mill site. And then also um, a necessary resolution to have the city continue to meet by teleconference. Our business items will include uh, an update from the city attorney on the national opioid litigation settlement and recommending that uh, the city participate in that. The first reading of the zoning regulations to incorporate um, changes for accessory dwelling units to comply with state policy. And then a supplemental budget request to take some of the parks funding that was designated for Prop 68 match last year and roll it into the current year's budget so we can continue to use that for parks funding projects. And then unmet transit needs to solicit input from the community on what, what needs uh, they may have with regard to transit that aren't being met. And then there's a discussion item people may be interested in. We'll be talking about the American Rescue Plan Act funds and really just laying out for the public what the city has intended for the use of those funds, what, how much will be held in reserves. And, and so there'll be a ability to provide input on that discussion of how the city should spend those funds. And the total amount the city's receiving is 2.9 million. And for this group, we're, you know, the city's designated quite a bit, about 2 million of that to go to uh, the city's planned police facility, as well as an additional amount for a contingency. So a lot's gonna go towards that, but there's a little bit more capacity there as well. And then there's some closed session items. Um, one of those is uh, the introduction, we're starting negotiations and then city manager performance evaluation followed by city council. So that's all we have on the agenda for tonight. Thank you. Anyone else have anything they'd like to share? Any announcements, anything exciting going on? Rex. Yeah, I don't, and I was gonna let Merritt do the performance evaluation. This could be your last meeting with us then? You, you never know what could happen. <laughs> no, Merritt, do you want to bring out, uh, are you going to bring up tonight, do you want to let everybody know about the current health? Yeah. I, uh, I, and just, just so everybody's aware, because I think it's coming out. I think the press release is coming out. Just let everybody know what the, the numbers look like. And just so you guys have a an understanding. It, it's yeah, out. So, it was published yeah, 20 yeah. minutes ago. Yeah. And just what Rex is speaking to is I received a call and there's been a release by County Public Health and there's been an uptick in COVID cases and the county's really concerned from Southern Eureka all the way down through Scotia and so a lot of the Hill River Valley. So really they are seeing higher number of cases, higher number of hospitalizations and they have concerns about a lower vaccination rate in the area that covers the zip codes that they're indicating, but really Scotia, Rio Del, Fortuna, Southern Eureka. And so they're they're concerned and in, in to, I don't have a great description of what he put out, but it sounds like it might already be in the, the paper, but really it's just a notice to healthcare providers that they should be looking for the, looking at this and how they deal with it. And then I think there's a community um, information piece, really just letting the community know that, hey, this is becoming an issue and we're seeing higher rates in um, the Eel River Valley area as compared with Arcadia and Eureka. Take it in stride, guys. This too shall pass. Anybody else want to share? Okay. Well, Emily Hobelman, business consultant, it's all you. Great. Thank you so much. And thanks to Renee and the chamber for having me today. I'm excited to talk about my business and what I do. And I want to thank Merritt too for a more complete picture of what happened on Friday at the FBID meeting workshop. <laughs> and the Spookathon as well. I didn't make it to Runner Park yesterday, but I had a friend tell me it was like being at Lollapalooza. It was like so packed and so many people. So I was really happy to hear it was such a success. <laughs> All right, so let me dive into this here. There we go. Let's 
start my presentation. All right, so I am a consultant, a small business consultant, and I mostly work with small cannabis businesses. I do work with some businesses outside of the industry, but primarily I work with, with cannabis businesses. So just a brief introduction to the track and trace program in California. Metric is the mandated software program that licensed cannabis businesses in California have to use to track their product through the supply chain. So you may have heard the phrase from seed to sale. And this is very much true about metric. Everything is tracked all the way from when a plant is a seedling or a small clone all the way through to the retail setting where customers are purchasing materials, the end user. So licensees are required to report things like transferring between licenses, receiving products, moving plants around their, their farm, harvesting plants, packaging plants. Um, any change in disposition is, is a required reporting event for metric. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the cultivation side of the track and trace program. I've worked with some distribution and manufacturing companies, but primarily I work with farmers and cultivators. So I work with small cannabis businesses, mostly with people who either don't have the time or patience to deal with the metric system, or maybe they don't have the computer savvy either. Um, I work with a lot of people who don't speak English as their first language as well. So dealing with the track and trace system can be challenging in that way. Um, so basically anyone who wants help with, with their metric administration, I'm happy to help whether that's coaching or actually managing the program for them. So why do we have a track and trace program? Just a brief discussion about this. I mean, one thing is to prevent diversion into the black market. So this is some sort of insurance that everything that's cultivated and produced in the cannabis industry in California in the legal market stays in the legal market. There's also a quality control angle to this. If some contaminated product gets out there, this enables the authorities to trace the product back to its uh, originating license. <clears throat> and then also the metrics that come out of the track and trace program, like the name of metric. So this is giving the authorities a pretty detailed picture of um, how much people are producing, um, plant yields, just, and you can think about that in terms of the manufacturing side of things as well. Um, you know, how much product is moving through the market. So how this works, uh, licensees are required to report certain activities to metric. Um, generally, it's a three-day time frame that you have to report something that you're doing with your license, but some activities are required within 24 hours. So there's an honor system element where you have to engage with the system every couple of days at least. Um, so many tags, here is a plant tag at the bottom right corner. You can see this long number here. This is a unique identifier number that's associated with this particular tag. The license number is on here in the middle. The name of the license is up here at the top. So lots and lots of tags go into metric. And these tags actually have little uh, chips in them so they can be read with a, a radio frequency identification scanner. And then the last thing about the how is cannabis licensees are subject to inspections and lots of people go through lots of inspections with different agencies. So to talk more about the tags, it's, Tags for days. We have two types of tags that are used with the metric program. Here on the left is a plant tag. So it's like a long rectangular tag with two holes in it that you can put a zip tie through to attach it to a plant. This is a Matole Valley Organics tag. And I am okay using this picture because it was a picture I took for a story that I wrote for Kim Kemp about moving cannabis through the metric program. So you can see Dylan used a staple gun to attach the tags to his plants. So he thought this was a pretty slick way to do it. they were supposed to be tamper evident, zip ties or some way to show if the tags have been tampered with. So I guess a staple is, is sufficient. And then there's package tags. So package tags, you would think of something that goes with packaged pounds, 
packaged product. If you have a box of pre-rolls, you're gonna stick a package tag on that box for tracing it through the system. So this is uh, lots and lots of package tags right here. So just a quick view into the metric portal. Because you're working with so many tags, you have uh, this inventory of tags that a metric person would reference all of the time, right? So you want to make sure you're using available tags. Once a tag's been used, it's marked as used in the system and unavailable. Um, so just a quick story. I had a client get inspected about a week ago. And this is the first time I've heard of this happening, but one of the inspectors had one of the RFID guns and they went through the garden and scanned all the plant tags in the garden. And this inspector was able to say, you're missing these five tags or these five tags are out of place in your garden. So over the years, all the inspections I've helped people through, this is the first time that one of the inspectors actually had one of those RFID scanners and they were able to tell with some real certainty what was out of place in the garden. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, there's a lot of variations with the inspections. So every single plant that a cultivator is growing gets one of these plant tags. And for immature plants, they actually are tagged in groups of up to 100. So let's just talk a bit about what it takes to be in the cannabis industry. So if you want to have a cultivation license, you have to obtain that license through California's Department of Cannabis Control. It used to be three different agencies doing the licenses for uh, cannabis businesses in California, but that it's all been consolidated recently under one umbrella organization. So here's a provisional cannabis cultivation license. Um, so you also need approval from your local jurisdiction as well. Um, so I'm sure all of you know that getting a cannabis license is really expensive and time consuming. Um, keeping a license is also challenging. There's changes in the regulations that you have to pay attention to. You have to cooperate with your local jurisdiction. Um, and of course, you have to renew your license every year and keep up with these inspections. Um, I have a client in Southern Humboldt who's on a really large parcel and they had consent from their land partner to cultivate for the past few years, but this land partner recently revoked their consent. So this client of mine is actually losing their cannabis license tomorrow, which is really bad timing with harvest season. So they're scrambling to get everything harvested and, and out of their possession in the next day. So it's, it's a really tough industry to be in. Um, so another license that you have to obtain as a cannabis cultivator is what's called a Waymaster license. So this is uh, kind of a broad thing for the agricultural industry. So you get a Waymaster license to basically verify that you are, anything you are moving into the supply chain, you are issuing a certificate with detail that is, can be provided to the state if required. So it's just another piece of paperwork that you have to have. Um, but this is a really important thing, right? So anything you're entering into the track and trace system has to be weighed on a certified scale. So the scale you use has to be registered, tested, and sealed. You can see the seal right here from the County of Humboldt Ag Department. So generally cultivators are using two different types of scales. On the right here, this is a hanging scale. So you would think of hanging branches or whole plants on a scale like this. And in the middle, this is a platform scale. Um, there's really big platform scales you can get to that you can put totes of product on as well. So just wanted to give you some background. It's kind of like the price of admission for being on metric. You have to be licensed with the Department of Cannabis Control and you have to have this Waymaster license to participate in this system. So just a little more background and basics. I don't know if you guys are familiar with growing weed, um, but there's two different ways people start their pot plants. So either from seed, Here's some seed on the left. I didn't take that picture, but it's beautiful. And on the right, we have clones. So um, 
both of these things, seeds and clones, are things that cultivators can make themselves or they can be purchased through a licensed nursery. But the big deal about the track and trace system is that everything you have in the system has to be sourced from somewhere else in the system. So if you're making the seeds or clones yourself, that's fine, but you have to source from your own plants to make those seeds or clones. And if you're not making your own immature plants, then you have to purchase them um, from another license. So when metric first came online for California licensees, there was a window of time, like about a year where you could create items out of thin air. And this is what they would tell you when you would call metric, they would say, okay, you need to make your package out of thin air, or you need to make your set of plants out of thin air. So there was this functionality in the system where you could create plants out of nothing. But California has since closed that window. So you can't source from nowhere. You have to source from other plants or from other licenses. So this went on because there was a staggered entry into the metric system. There wasn't like one day where everybody was on metric. It took over a year to get all the licensees on metric. So it was kind of an interesting time. So we're back into another view in metric. Basically you have immature plants and flowering plants and harvested plants. So we're looking at some immature plants inventory here. Like I mentioned, immature plants are grouped. So you have one tag here, you can see this group on the left is a group of biscotti located in the nursery. They're clones and there's 72 plants in this group. The challenging thing about the immature plants group is that you use one tag for up to 100 plants, but then you have to label every single plant in that group with the tag number. And the tag number is 24 characters. So some people buy like Avery, Avery label printers or special printers to print like the plastic plant identification tags that you would find at a regular nursery. So you can kind of see in this picture that this person labeled every single small plant with that UID number. So it's, it's a lot of work uh, with the immature plants. I don't know if you can conceive of um, trying to label a hundred plants with this tag number, but, but it's, it's a lot. It challenges people. So immature plants, when a plant switches into flowering, when it gets big enough to start producing buds, and this is dependent on a change in the photo period or how much uh, light the plant is exposed to, at this point in the metric system, every single plant gets its own tag. So when they're immature, it's one tag for a group. And then when they're considered mature and that by law that's defined as a plant has reached a certain size or it's flowering. Every single plant gets its own tag. So in this view, you can see here's the tag number and the plant associated with that tag number. It's platinum OG, it's in greenhouse two. Here's the group it came from. It was a clone. <clears throat> here's the date its group was created. So that's when it was, it was an immature plant. And then here's the phase date. So that's when it switched to flowering. So you can see some of the functionality here. You can replace tags. You can change strains in California, which is an interesting thing. If you realize you're growing a platinum OG plant, but maybe it's a, just a regular OG Kush plant, you have that capability of changing the strain name. You can move plants around. Whoops. Uh, you can destroy plants. You can record supplements that you're giving your plants you are required to report waste. So I'll talk about this more in a couple minutes, but if you leaf your plants or like a branch gets broken off, you are required to report the weight of that branch that gets broken into the metric system. Um, so here, these two buttons, create plantings and create immature plant packages. Those are for creating clones. And then we have manicure and harvest. So that's, pretty self-explanatory when you're harvesting, you would select a plant and hit harvest and you have to enter the weight of that plant into the system. So one thing cultivators are required to do is to reconcile their inventory every 30 days at least. 
So the people I work with every month, we're checking in about what's in metric versus what's on the ground. And oftentimes we're checking in more about that, but, but I have a pretty regular inventory check with people to make sure we're on the same page. Um, and this is a good time to point out that people have to report any changes in their, their cannabis product to metric within three days. So just because I keep throwing these terms around, I wanted to talk quickly. And again, this is, you know, you may know this about growing cannabis plants, but if not, um, just to let you know, there's two, two types of growth for the cannabis plant. Um, so we have vegetative growth and then when plants are in flower, when they're growing their buds. So vegetative growth um, is when the plant is small and uh, you're growing it up before it starts flowering. So this is light dependent. Um, and generally you keep a plant in vegetative growth for like one to two months. So if you think about an indoor setup, you would have the lights on these plants in vegetative growth for at least 18 hours a day. So plants switch into flowering when a change in light happens. So when the light is suddenly down to like 14 or 12 hours less per day than the plant's gonna go into flower. So I try to think about this in terms of like fall, like the day's getting shorter and the plants go into flower, but that doesn't apply to all plants out there. This is, uh, so it's not a really good analogy. Um, and I wanted to just talk about light deprivation briefly too, if you're not familiar with what light dep is, but I'm sure you've heard the term thrown around a lot. This is when cultivators force their plants to flower by shortening the photo period. So if plants are in a greenhouse in the beginning of summer with those long days, you can cover the greenhouse with a tarp and block out the light and force the plants to flower. So it's kind of a little like weed growing 101, but I feel like those are important elements to clarify as we talk about the track and trace system. So like I mentioned a few minutes ago, if any part of your plant or your whole plant is destroyed or moldy or broken, you are required to report the weight of what you are throwing out into the metric system. So this picture here on the top, this plant is burned. So that entire plant would be considered waste. And down here on the bottom right, this was a deer salad bar. The deer got in and ate all the plants in this greenhouse. And actually someone told me a tip that deer come in and eat a bunch of plants because they're thirsty. So if you put out buckets of water, the deer will drink the water instead of eating your plants. And I don't know if that works, but I thought that was pretty interesting. So this is a pretty, um, I think, poignant example of how regulated people are. So if you have a branch break off of your plant, you have to <laughs> report the weight of that branch to metric. So what we're looking at here is uh, the metric view of destroying an entire plant. So let's say you have a plant get burned, maybe you have damage from voles. I had a client a couple years ago have some cows get into her greenhouse and ate the entire greenhouse. So we had to destroy all those plants in metric. So when you're destroying a plant in metric, you have to tell the system how you destroyed the plant. So in this example, the waste method is compost. You have to say what you mixed with the destroyed plant. So again, we have compost here. You have to put the date of destruction, you have to put the reason, and you have to put a note. So the reasons um, you pick from a list that could be contamination, male plants, failure to thrive. There are some different options that you can choose from. So it's just to me like a really clear example of how regulated cultivators are. I mean, there's like an extreme level of reporting you have to have to have to participate with. So of course, after plants go into flower and get their big, beautiful buds, we go into harvesting plants. So this, of course, is an activity that has to be reported into metric. So let's say you have 500 plants, you cut them all down, you have to weigh every single plant that you cut down. You are by law required to report the entire weight of every single plant that you grow. So it's, it's pretty serious. Um, so I, if you are familiar with growing, you may know that outdoor plants 
can get really large and when they're harvested they're harvested in pieces so you're not necessarily cutting the whole plant down at once but if you're going growing in a greenhouse or indoor then you probably would be cutting the whole plant down at once so metric does have a manicure harvest option where you can open what's called a harvest batch so it's basically like a bucket in metric that you are adding weight into over time if you harvest all at once, then you dump everything into that bucket, which is called a harvest batch. So you can see here in this metric view, this is an ice cream cake harvest batch. So we've got where the harvest batch is stored, how many plants went into it, and the entire wet weight of that harvest batch. So in practice, you would cut down your greenhouse, you would weigh every single plant, you would record the weight of every single plant and you would enter the weight of every single plant into metric. And then over time, you have 60 days to have this harvest batch open in metric. So over time, that material would dry. So you would have some weight loss due to moisture. And then of course, you would start bucking the material off of the stems and into totes or bags and maybe even trimming it as well. So like I said, every three days, you need to be in metric updating this information. Um, you know, if you're starting to put material into totes, you need to weigh what's in those totes and you have to report that information to metric. So we're gonna move into talking about packages at this point. So here's a view of what it looks like to manage your packages in metric. So on the top right, you can see some manicured flour. So when you think about packages, like I said earlier, you would use those package tags for um, anything that's not a plant that you are working with in the cannabis supply chain. So that could be totes of dried plant material, that could be cleaned pounds, that could be boxes of pre-rolls or, um, if you're a manufacturer and you're making extracts or vape cartridges, if you have a box of vape cartridges, you would use a package tag for that box. So on the bottom right here, this is a package tag. It's a sticker. So you can see, again, there's the name of the licensee at the top that's blacked out, their license number, and then we have the UID number, the unique identifier associated with that sticker. So in the view and metric, we have some packages inventory. So we have the tag number on the left, the harvest that the package came from, and then the packages that that package was sourced from. So it's this whole traceability, right? Everything's gotta come from something else. And then we have what is in the package. So on that first line, we have wedding cake flour. And then we have the category that that package falls into. And the category is something that's set by the state. So you can have flour, you can have leaf or shake, um, you can have clones. So if you're a nursery, you would be selling packages of clones. Um, you can also have packages of fresh plant. I just did a fresh frozen harvest uh, about a week or two ago. So someone with a refrigerated truck, a distributor with a refrigerated truck came to the cultivation site and took these fresh plants straight to a manufacturer in a refrigerated truck for the manufacturer to use for extraction. Um, and you can also have packages of pre-rolls and seeds and keef extract, all of those things. Um, so in this view, we're looking at some packages of wedding cake flour, platinum OG leaf. Um, so there's flour and leaf packages that would come from someone's harvest. So once your product is packaged, ideally you would be selling it and moving it off of your farm or cultivation facility to a distributor or a processing facility or a manufacturer. So everything that is transferred between licensees has to be transferred in metric. So if you're transferring that 60 pounds of wedding cake flour, you're going to transfer that material through the metric portal and in that process, you're producing a shipping manifest. So I put a picture of a Sprinter van. Maybe you see them around Humboldt County, all these vans driving around. They're probably hauling cannabis product, whatever you're seeing. Um, so these drivers are required to carry this transportation manifest. So this is 
this takes a lot of coordination. So in any transfer, you have the originating licensee. So the person sending the product out, you have the transporter, which is a distribution company, and then you have the receiving license. So sometimes the transporter is the receiving license, but sometimes it's not. So you have to get information from the distribution company, from the transporter to make this manifest. So if I'm a farmer and I want to move my product, I have to get a hold of this distribution company and I have to get the name of the driver. I have to get the driver's license number. I have to get the make and model of the vehicle that they're using. And I have to get the license plate of the vehicle that they're using. So it definitely requires some coordination. And then I have to have a printer to print this manifest out to give the driver when they come pick up the material. So I think this has been a steep curve for people in Humboldt County or in these rural areas cultivating that maybe have spotty internet access or don't have a printer. So to really be compliant with metric, you need to have a printer, you need to have internet access, and you need to have this information to make this paperwork. So this is uh, my favorite part of working with people is their transfers because I'll often get calls you know, hey, someone's coming to pick up my product in an hour. Can you make this transfer happen? It's happened twice recently where I got a call from one of my clients on a Saturday night. One time recently when my in-laws were over for dinner, like, hey, someone's coming to pick up my product tonight. Please, can you make this transfer manifest for me? I was on vacation in September and someone called me like, hey, I'm selling product. I need a transfer manifest. So this is part of my business. I'm on call for people. I will drop what I'm doing and I will get into metric and I will make transfer manifests happen for people. So it's uh, fun to be on call. It's fun, not fun to be on call for people, but it's, it's part of what I do. So you can see this is the bottom half of a manifest. So you, here's the tag number for the package that's being shipped. This is for fresh frozen. So we've got apple fritters, fresh plant and then the weight of what's being transported. So the, the package tag thing is kind of a misnomer because this material isn't necessarily packaged, but because of the how the track and trace system is set up, I, everything either gets a plant tag or a package tag. So plants get plant tags and everything else gets package tags. All right, so I wanted to talk quickly about managing data. So when we talk about doing a harvest, um, some small cultivators have a few hundred plants and some small cultivators have a few thousand plants. So because you have to enter so much data into metric, metric has a option where you can upload CSV files with data. So here's an example of a CSV file. So like I said, when you harvest your plants, you have to enter the weight of every single plant into metric. So here's a harvest CSV file. So in column A, we have a plant's tag number. In column B, we have the weight of that plant. Column C is the units of weight. D is where the plant material is being dried. E is the harvest batch. So this is like the bucket you're dumping all that wet weight into. And then you have the license number and the date. So when you're working with people who have many thousands of data points that need to be entered into metric, then you're definitely working with these CSV files and managing data in this way. Some of my clients are great. They fill out spreadsheets for me. They send me Excel files um, and they're super organized and on top of it. And some of my clients uh, send me information in this way. So, on the bottom left here, we have someone's harvest information. So they've got the tag number, the last four digits, the strain, and then the wet weight. It's fine with me. I'm billing people for my time. So if they send me pictures of their notebooks with wet weights, I will do the data entry and bill them for that time. But I've had some late nights trying to read through people's handwritten notes, getting their harvest data. This example in the middle, is from someone assigning plant tags to different plants in their garden. And this example is pretty bad because the tag numbers are jumping around. They go from 563 to 446 to 566. 
so this is kind of a nightmarish situation here where someone's sending me their plant tag assignments um, and it's just completely out of order and discombobulated. So in that case, you know, that was a, a more time consuming project trying to figure out what that person was doing. And this is where it gets really hard for people with metric. You're dealing with all these tags and every single plant has to have a tag and there has to be this level of organization with your strains and your locations. <laughs> and that's not a natural thing for some people. For me, I'm like a fairly, fairly organized person. So I would say, you know, strain one is in greenhouse one and I'm gonna use tags one through 500 on that greenhouse. But other people, you give them a bunch of tags and then they just, I don't know, throw them up in the air and make a big mess out of them and then try to put them on plants. So it's a really, it can be really hard for people, I think, to stay organized with metric. Um, this last picture on the right hand side. So that's someone emailing me tag numbers and weights. And that's, that's nice. That's something I can copy paste into a spreadsheet and I can organize easily. But it's, you know, things vary with how I get information. I'll have people send me pictures of tags as a way of communicating information. It's a lot of pictures coming to me. So it's, uh, it can be interesting. I know, uh, I always show my boyfriend at home the, the random texts I'm getting from people with their information <laughs> that they're sending. So I hope you can gain an appreciation of what cannabis cultivators have to go through to be compliant with these tags um, from some of these examples. As I mentioned at the beginning, um, inspections are a big part of the way the state makes sure people are actually uh, doing what they're supposed to do with the track and trace system. This picture on the left, I took this picture off of Facebook. So I've never actually had one of my clients receive these forms, but I'm in a group on Facebook called Navigating Metric California. It's amazing. Everyone's in this group posting about their challenges with metric, the ways they figure out these challenges, how they overcome some of the harder parts of dealing with the track and trace system. And then people also talk about their experiences with the authorities and getting inspected. So someone received this metric specific inspection form and posted it on Facebook. And it's kind of blurry, but you can see all of the different things that the authorities are looking at as they visit your farm and they're checking how you do your track and trace. So there's, there's a lot of requirements on people with, with how to do this, you know, and it's all the stuff I've talked about. So your immature plants have to have a single tag for a group of up to 100 and all of those individual plants have to have that single tag number. Every single flowering plant has to have a tag and those tags can't have dirt on them and they have to be visible. They're supposed to be clean and positioned in a way that an inspector can walk in your greenhouse and see all of the tags down the rows. So there, it's like a lot of uh, particular requirements for cultivators. Um, so if you're not in compliance and you have an inspection, um, you could face some serious penalties. So generally what I'm seeing is that if something is found in an inspection that isn't compliant, then the, the authorities give you some time frame to correct it. But on the right hand side, I have an excerpt from a letter from someone who got millions of dollars in fines for not tagging their plants correctly, for having more plants than they were supposed to. So they were growing outside of their allotted canopy size. There was numerous violations. I mean, this was like a 40 page letter from Cal Cannabis, um, which was the agency administering cultivation licenses before the DCC came about this past year. So it's, it's pretty high pressure, but I, I'm seeing that people aren't facing criminal penalties, they're facing these financial penalties for not being in compliance. So here's what's called a notice of non-compliance or a notice of violations. So after someone gets inspected and if problems are found, which they usually are in my experience, then the authority will send this letter describing what the problem is. So here's the code that they have violated in this case, uh, the license holder had a name on the metric account of someone that didn't work there anymore. So they give you the violation and what needs to happen to fix it. And generally the state will give you like 15, 30 days to fix things like this. And if it's a big problem, 
then the state is going to tell you to destroy everything and your license is suspended. So, hey, uh, Emily, we're running short on time and I want to make sure people can ask you questions. Are you, where are you at in your presentation? This is my last slide. <laughs> I know it's a lot to talk about and it's just such no, like a good. broad stroke view. <laughs> I and just wanted people to have a chance to ask questions. So go yeah, ahead. Hopefully you're not sleeping um, hearing about this because it's <laughs> such a dorky uh, field to be in. So this is my last slide. So I'm just going to bring up the futility and the functionality metric. It, the program itself is super glitchy. Here's a picture on the top. It runs slow. It gets stuck. There was a couple weeks over the summer where metric didn't work for anyone. And it was just a big problem. I mean, think about it. If you have someone coming to pick up your 500 pounds and you can't get metric to work to print out this shipping manifest, it's really frustrating. People complain that it's busy work. I mean, you're putting tags on every single plant only to dump the weights of those plants into a harvest batch where you lose the fine detail of those tag numbers. So a lot of it seems like busy work or just wasteful. And of course, it's confusing for people. The regulations don't necessarily match how metric works in practice. Um, in terms of functionality, it's great for inventory tracking. I mean, I think the people I work with, there's great value in, in seeing how much their yields are in this fine level of detail and to have to keep track of how many plants they have. Um, you know, it's a legit way for the state to maintain oversight on this industry and it ensures a cohesion in the market. So to move product in the white market, you have to be moving it in metric, which requires all of these licenses to be valid with the state regulating agencies. So that's, I'll stop there. I know it's a lot to talk about, but I really appreciate everybody listening to me. I know my friends and family listen to me talk about metric all the time um, because I just, I love talking about it. I think it's a really fun thing, but it's challenging for people. So yes, of course, questions, please. <laughs> Denise. Okay, question. Hi, Hi, Emily. That was very informative. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I'm not cannabis savvy at all. Um, I just wondered in your expertise, um, are folks really following all these regulated pieces? Are they hiring people like you to help them do it? Are there still folks, I can imagine, you know, folks that never had to do anything like this, all of a sudden thrown into all this spreadsheet management of all those tags. I mean, please share what you know on that. Um all of my clients follow the law to a T, of course. Um, I think that in reality, people do struggle with the requirements laid out by the state. Um, and I think the hard part too is like the gamble with inspections. So I work with some people who have never been inspected and I work with other people who have been inspected three, four, five times. So I think people are rolling the dice like, okay, I'm supposed to tag every single immature plant in this group with the tag number, but am I really going to get inspected before I plant my greenhouses? So I, I would imagine like bigger companies, which I don't work with, I work with small companies are, are really on point, you know, but people who are out in the hills are maybe pushing it in terms of being compliant with metric because you can get away with not being compliant. It's like the honor system reporting. Yeah, I made this plant group, but I don't have to submit a picture showing that I tagged every single little plant. So I think it's a mix. Great. Melissa. Thank you. Yeah, Melissa, you're up. Don't laugh at us. Uh, hey, Emily. <laughs> Hi. Um, I just wanted to say that I had to laugh when you were posting all of the photos that they send you of the metrics because I have my cannabis clients that send me the strain names and I can't tell an O or a G for the life of me sometimes. And it is like, the most frustrating thing and you call them and they're on a hill and they have no phone service and you're screwed. 
So I'm just curious, how many of your clients are very true to start off at the beginning with applying with the metrics and being like full bore on board with it when it's small and easy versus at the end when they're ready to harvest, stuff is dying, stuff's dying off. Are they all really sticking to that type of stuff or are they just doing the bare minimum to get by? I think it really depends on the personality type. I think some people are just more naturally organized and like uh, on top of providing information. And some people are just way more scattered and then they don't get to me till the end. And I think it's about half and half with the clients I work with. There are some clients that I can count on. They're going to let me know ahead of time what they're doing, what they're growing, when the clones are coming. And then other people who call me three, four days a week later, hey, I got clones delivered last week and I need to get them in my metric inventory. I'm like, well, you need to give me a heads up the day before. So it's, it's really a mix for me. And then I have to pick my battles with how much detail I want to get out of people. You know, if I'm trying to clarify some detail with some people, it's really easy to get clarification and other people I'm calling, I'm emailing, I'm bugging people trying to say it was, is that an apple fritters plan or is that apricot gelato, whatever it is. I mean, it's, yeah, it really seems like personality dependent, I think, with how organized people are and proactively communicating about it. But yeah, it's interesting. I thought I saw Supervisor Bushnell's hand up, but I don't know, I think she had to leave. Yeah, it looked like she put her mask on and had to go to a meeting, but I, I had a quick question. So do you know, and if you don't, that's okay, other agricultural uh, farmers, um, you know, particularly those harvesting for food, human food consumption, not, you know, feed for cattle or whatever. Um, are, are there requirements um, through the supply chain? I can't imagine uh, like a corn farmer having to label every single plant. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, as far as I know, the cannabis industry is the most regulated yeah. industry. Um, and I even wonder about the hemp market as well. Like I know in one state, you're required to use metric to track your hemp plant production, but it's, you know, it's just so changes from state to state, but certainly you wouldn't expect someone growing corn to tag every single corn plant and to like weigh the entire weight of their corn plant. So it's- Or, or, or to mark when it got damaged by something and then, yeah. Yeah, can you imagine having to weigh that year of corn that got moldy and report it to a computer? I mean, it's, no. it's a really like high bar that yeah. cannabis cultivators have to meet. No. Yeah, so that's a great, no, I don't think there is any other industry regulated so tightly. There, is, I was watching this Amazon Prime video show called Clarkson's Farm and it's a guy, he's a comedian and he has a big farm in like Europe or something. And he has to record all of it. It's just, and it reminded me of the cannabis metrics that all of our clients have to go through. And yeah, they have to report the loss, how much fertilizer they used, how much um, the, uh, the aisle is between each of their crops, um, which is similar to what our farmers have to do with the amount of distance that they're cultivating around their um, each bush. It's insane. But yeah, yeah, so you see people hard. like simplifying what they're doing. Maybe someone used to grow five, six, seven, eight strains every season, and now they just grow one because it makes it so much easier with metric one or two. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a really challenging system to be a part of. And something else to point out is metric is in use in like 15 states, I think. So different states have different track and trace programs. And this just happens to be the one that California has chosen that people are required to use. So it's different all over the place, depending on where you are. Yeah. Okay, Mike Johnson's waving his hand. Last question. Oh, a quick question, and I think it's pretty simple. Would you say that all of this paperwork and track and trace is tax money driven for recovery by the state? What do you mean? Like, can you clarify that question? 
they're tracing everything from point A to point Z with the idea that they want to maximize their tax recovery for funding. I, I don't know if I get what you're saying. <laughs> well, what I mean is the state came up with this system mm -hmm. to ensure that they are getting every last dollar that they can out of the tax on those products. I mean, I have two thoughts on that. Like, yeah, that that makes sense, I, I think, but also like, I think it really lowers farm productivity to have to deal with like such an intensive track and trace program. So I think it makes it harder for people to be productive. So in that way, the state could be getting less tax money, but certainly it's a way to make sure they're getting all of their tax money. Uh, I was thinking along the lines of they're more, in, they want to make sure they're getting all of it uh, at perhaps at the cost of productivity and efficiency. Yeah. I like your answer. They're, they're certain they're <laughs> certainly getting it from the end user. That's for sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. there's like multiple points where people are taxed in the supply yeah. chain for cannabis expensive. Yeah. Well, great. Uh, thank you, Emily. Uh, it was very informative. Uh, thanks for being here and, and walking us through it. Uh, yeah, I mean, I have a new uh, appreciation for the regulatory hurdles in the cannabis cultivation arena, particularly. So thank you for that. Um, and thanks, everybody, for being here. And we will see you next week with Nordic Aqua Farm. So have a great week and stay dry if you can. And we'll see you Monday. Bye. Bye.